Hello everyone, uh, good morning and happy holidays to all of you. In this video, we will talk about the uh, treatment and management of the cardiogenic shock, which is the last part uh, in the series of the uh, cardiogenic shock. And at the end of the video, please press the like button, which is located on the left side of your screen. And also press the subscribe button, which is located on the right side of your screen. And on the right of that button is the bell icon and also press it. And in between all of these buttons, there is a share button. Please share the video. Thank you so much for watching the video once again. So when we talk about the treatment or management of the cardiogenic shock, let's make a list of the uh, intervention which we can do in all these patients who we have diagnosed as a case of cardiogenic shock. Now, the first thing which is important is the resuscitation. Whenever these patients are received, we resuscitate them. Then second is the vaso use of vasopressor and inotropes, which is very much related with the uh, resuscitation process. Then comes the use of thrombolytic agents or uh, we go for the percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty and we can also opt for the coronary artery bypass graft depending upon the angiography which is a part of obviously uh, PTCA. Then there, there can be the use of intra-aortic balloon pump. Sometime it also has its role in the resuscitation phase of the management of the cardiogenic shock. And then uh, other than the intra-aortic balloon pump, we can also use left ventricular assist devices. And uh, other than all of these, there are certain other drugs and uh, miscellaneous procedure which we can perform, which we are going to talk about uh, briefly. So now the patient uh, is diagnosed as a case of cardiogenic shock. And we also know uh, in shock, the systolic blood pressure is less than 90 millimeter of the mercury. And there is a hypoperfusion of the vital organs of the body. How we know that there is vital organs, uh, hypoperfusion can be present. This is whenever mean arterial pressure is less than 60 to 65 millimeter of the mercury. Mercury. This mean arterial pressure, famously known as MAP, is the pressure which is perfusing the vital organs including the brain, heart, kidney, lungs and the liver. So mean arterial pressure is calculated by uh, having a two-third of the diastolic pressure. Blood pressure is added with the one-third of the systolic blood pressure. So whenever it is less than 60 to 65 millimeter of the mercury, then we are to see if the patient is having the pulmonary edema. Our patient is volume depleted or volume overloaded. If there is no pulmonary edema, then we can give 200 to 300 ml of the normal saline, 0.9% stat. And then we can reassess the patient. And if there is a fear of the volume overload, then we are to take help of the vaso, either the vasopressors or the inotropic support uh, for the patient. At this stage of the uh, management of the cardiogenic shock, the stage of resuscitation, we should also not forget the importance of uh, two interventions like we may pass uh, central venous pressure line, which is a triple lumen line and uh, it, it may be passed in the right internal jugular vein or right subclavian vein. Why we are avoid the left subclavian clavian or the left side of, uh, of the body? Because we may need to pass uh, in these patients the uh, pacemaker, so uh, that can uh, be a problem in the future. So we pass central CVP line for purpose of the volume status assessment, for uh, having a multiple IV lines, and because inotropic and vasopressor sports, they are uh, hyper or smaller, if given through the peripheral line, they can damage it. So they are easily given through the uh, central venous pressure line. We, we should also pass at this stage the arterial line or A line, and that will help us uh, in the continuous blood pressure monitoring. The, why it can it is different from the non-invasive way of assessing the blood pressure. Even if the blood pressure is on the very lower side, it can measure it uh, as compared to the sphygmomanometer or the palpatory method. Uh, lastly, we at this stage, we should also avoid the beta blocker and calcium channel blocker because both of these drugs will uh, damage the uh, situation of the patient and can deteriorate the uh, cardiogenic shock. The first of the three very important vasopressors is the dopamine. It's a precursor of the epinephrine and norepinephrine. And uh, we give it in the dosage form of the 5 microgram per kilogram per minute to 20 microgram per kg per minute. It's a 200 milligram injection and this is dissolved in 50 uh, ml of the normal saline 
and then it is filled in the infusion pump and started from this dose up till this dose. In a dosage of less than 5 microgram per kilogram per minute, uh, the dopamine increases the renal blood flow, mesenteric blood flow and coronary blood flow. So it's good for the kidneys in this dosage form which is less than 5 microgram per kg per minute. But in a dosage form of 5 to 10 microgram per kg per minute, in increases, it increases the cardiac performance because it has got its positive inotropic effect through the beta-1 receptor stimulation. But at a dosage form, which is higher than 10 microgram per kg per minute, there will, it will increase the blood pressure due to the stimulation of the alpha receptors on the peripheral vasculature. Last of the two norepinephrine uh, vasopressors are the norepinephrine and epinephrine. Norepinephrine is a drug of choice when uh, you see that there is no response or less response with the dopamine. Uh, mainly it's an alpha receptor so it stimulates the alpha receptors and causes the increase in the peripheral vascular resistance and this is how it increases the blood pressure. We have an injection of 4 mg we dilute it in 50 ml normal saline and it is put in the infusion pump and we start it at a dosage of the 0.2 microgram per kilogram per minute to 3.3 microgram per kg per minute. The last uh, of the vasopressors is the epinephrine. When everything else fails and patient is in the dire situation then only then we use the epinephrine. Uh, it is a stimulant of alpha 1, beta 1 and beta 2 receptors. So when it stimulates alpha 1, it increases the peripheral vascular resistance, but it decreases the splenclinic and renal blood flow. With the help of the beta 1 receptor stimulation, it causes the increase of the cardiac activity and it increases the stroke volume. Of the two or three uh, inotropic uh, medications which can be used in patients, uh, of the cardiogenic shock management. Dobutamine is the drug of choice or the very famous drug. There are though other like the phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors, amrinone and inamrinone, but dobutamine is a beta 1 stimulator and we have an injection of 250 milligram. We dilute it in 50 ml of the normal saline, place it in the infusion pump and we start it at a dosage for, uh, range of the 2 microgram per kilogram per minute to 20 microgram per kilogram per minute. It's a beta 1 stimulant so it increases the cardiac performance. But because of its effect on the beta 2 receptors, it also causes the peripheral vasodilatation. So, please do not start this medication as long as the patient's systolic blood pressure is less than 80 millimeter of the mercury because it can cause the peripheral vasodilatation and can cause a very dangerous fall in the systolic blood pressure. Now because majority of the cases of the cardiogenic shock they result from the heart attacks and especially the ST elevation MI or new onset left bundle branch block which clinically is suspected to be the new onset uh, ST elevation MI which is equivalent of new ST elevation MI if it's a new onset left bundle branch block with the clinical picture of the heart attack. So in all those cases the drug drugs which we use in the uh, are known as the thrombolytics are the one which which break the clot. Thrombo mean clot, lytics mean to break. But these are the inferior choice as compared to the angiography or the PCI which we call the percutaneous coronary intervention. But all those setups where we do not have the uh, privilege of having the PTCA, we opt the thrombolytics therapy. There are two drug of the choices. One is the uh, drug of the poor countries like the streptokinase. It's a, an old drug. It is, it is a clot non-specific. It can cause the allergic reaction. It can cause the bleeding. It can cause the brain hemorrhage. But otherwise, the clot buster or the thrombolytic of the choice will be the tissue plasminogen activator, which can be the retiplase, it can be altiplase or tenectiplase. So these are fibrin or clot specific and both the uh, streptokinase and tissue plasminogen activators, they are used in the patients of the either ST elevation MI or new onset left bundle branch block which is clinically related with the MI. But non-ST elevation MI and unstable angina are in those patients we do not use these medications. And these should be used within one hour of the uh, origin of the uh, problem but it can be uh, useful within uh, a limit of like uh, three or four hours. But the time of the choice is the uh, for the thrombolytics therapy is one hours. Uh, all those setups where uh, 
the facility of the uh, percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI or PTCA which is percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty is available. We should prefer the PTCA and PCI over thrombolytics because the success rate is very high as compared to the thrombolytics. But all those hospitals where this facility is not available and patient is still within the three hours uh, duration of the chest pain or the MI because, which is leading to the cardiogenic shock, then we should give the thrombolytics. But it's an inferior choice. So. PCI and PTCA, they are performed through the radial artery preferably, but obviously femoral artery can be chosen. Uh, angiography is the test which is performed to uh, diagnose the location of the thrombus in the coronary artery. So it is done through the radial artery with the help of catheter and contrast agents are used in this procedure. So always take care of the renal function of the test. And once we have known the uh, location of the thrombus in the coronary artery, we can use the balloon tipped on the catheter to reopen the occluded coronary artery and this procedure will be known as the angioplasty. But because there is a fear of restenosis, so we can place a stent at the very location of the presence of the thrombus once we have reopened the coronary artery and this will be known as angioplasty plus stenting. So this procedure is very important in all those patients uh, in which the reason of the cardiogenic shock is the myocardial infarction, especially like ST elevation MI or major MI. As I already mentioned that uh, angiography is performed to look for where the thrombus is present. And if uh, say the angiography shows us one thing that either the left main stem which is here, this is left main stem which subdivides into the LCX which is left circumflex artery and LAD which is left anterior descending artery. So if the thrombus is either here or all of these three coronary arteries have got the thrombus, R e RCA and LAD have got the thrombus, so two major arteries. In all of those cases, PTCA will not be effective. The better option will be the coronary artery bypass graft which we call the cabbage. So either the triple vessel disease or two main dominant vessels thrombus or a thrombus in the left main stem demands coronary artery bypass graft in those patients in whom the myocardial infarction is the reason of the cardiogenic shock. But when the, their studies have been done and they have showed that cabbage is an inferior choice then the PTCA in cases of very unstable cardiogenic shock. Why? Because mortality rate is very high in all those patients in whom the cabbage has been performed during very unstable situation. You, all, you need always to stabilize the patient first somehow and there will come the role of this intraortic balloon pump. If a patient is ve uh, hemodynamically very unstable, then to bridge uh, the gap or the time, between stabilization and that very moment when patient is hemodynamically very unstable and MI has caused the myocardium very ineffective because all those part of the myocardium which are damaged by the heart attack or the myocardial infarction, they do not contribute uh, in the cardiac output or cardiac performance. So there we use the intra-aortic balloon pump through the femoral artery, we insert it uh, under uh, uh, Florence's guidance are with the help of contrast. We take it all the way up till the area of the descending aorta. Now it contains the helium gas. During the diastole it inflates because there is a very important fact that during the diastole the coronary artery they are filled with the blood. So what will happen during the diastole that a lot of blood will go back towards the aortic valve which is closed here during diastole. So that blood will enter into the coronary circulation. So the coronary perfusion will be better. But during the systole, this uh, intraortic balloon pump, it deflates, it so sort of sucks the blood from the left ventricle. So left ventricular uh, afterload is decreased. So this way, the intraortic balloon pump, which is a temporary measure, which is not a permanent solution, helps to stabilize the patient to the extent that cardiac transplantation or any other intervention can be performed. So intraortic balloon pump is very important in these situations. Another temporary measure which can be used to decrease uh, stress on the heart in cases of the cardiogenic shock where the heart is the reason of the failure uh, of the pump, 
then we can also use the L VAD or the left ventricular assist devices. Here you see that the blood from the pulmonary vein comes to the left atrium. From the left atrium through the mitral valve, it enters to in the left ventricle, which is diseased. A part of it is not contributing to the cardiac output, but here we use this left ventricular assist device. Blood uh, from the left ventricle enters into the uh, left ventricular assist device through the inflow pipe and then it is it's controlled from the outside it's battery operated so it pushes the blood towards the aorta through the outflow pipe so this way uh, stress or the afterload and preload on the uh, left ventricle is decreased and this uh, in, uh, instrument which we call the left ventricular assist device can help all those patients which either need a temporary measure or they are so there are so many contraindication that nothing can be done so just to give some help to the patient we can place the left ventricular assist device but it is a very invasive procedure so patient patient selection should be optimized and they no, there it should not be done if it is not needed and lastly in the category of the other drugs are the miscellaneous we, we should use Dysprene in all of these patients. We can we also use the Clopidogrel. Uh, post uh, uh, angioplasty, these two are used for one year. In combination, they are used for uh, one year. This is known as dual antiplatelet therapy. But all those patients who have presented in the emergency department with the suspicion of myocardial infarction up as long as they had not undergone the angiography clopidogrel should be held why these patients may need uh, uh, to undergo the coronary artery bypass grafting so in all those patients who are to undergo any surgical procedure this may cause the problem of the bleeding so we are to hold it as long as we are to decide if patient needs emergency cabbage or not otherwise this dual antiplatelet therapy is continued for almost a year after post PCI or the PTCA. Injection heparin or low molecular weight heparin which is anoxaparin. These are antithrombotic and these are used when the patient presents in the emergency department. And injection heparin is a drug of choice even those patients who have got the renal problem. Then the use of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system antagonist like the enalapril and the captopril uh, there are other these uh, uh, antagonist their use should be individualized why because all those patients who have got either hypotension or they are on the vasopressor inotropic support or they have got a renal uh, profile disturbed more than twice the normal they are they are all contraindicated for the use of the uh, this very specific group of the drugs lastly there is a uh, procedure which we call the mechanical circulatory support procedures like the veno arterial extracorporeal membrane oxygenation so this is a machine which uses uh, uh, a system where the blood from the vein goes inside the machine and it adds oxygen and removes carbon dioxide and sends it back through the arteries. So this is known as veno arterial extracorporeal membrane oxygenation and it increases the oxygenation uh, within the body. So these are the miscellaneous or other drugs which are related with the management of the cardiogenic shock.